Okay, so um, Cathy Sudley does uh, ask me to give her apologies for not being able to be here. Um, what I'm just going to do is describe what we've been doing in terms of, of uh, the follow-up of uh, health outcomes in UK Biobank and where we are in terms of doing that. So in terms of the linkages that we're currently focusing on, um, there's death and cancer, uh, for which there's a long tradition of uh, linking uh, in, in such cohorts. Inpatient and outpatient hospital episode statistics, um, particularly in England, um, through uh, hospital episode statistics through the Information Centre, um, which also gives us information about um, related procedure re um, registries. The outpatient data uh, are not as good as the inpatient data, although they are improving. Uh, primary care records um, we are starting to link to, and particularly expect to get information about um, health conditions um, that go beyond the health conditions that lead to hospitalization. So that obviously extends the range of diseases um, that can be studied in such prospective cohorts. Um, the reason why diseases that um, uh, kill or maim um, get studied so well is that um, one's been able to link to death and cancer registries. Um, the reason why many other conditions are not so well studied is the difficulty of linkage. So I think primary care linkage will um, allow much, a much wider range of conditions to be studied in such cohorts. It also allows us to look at what prescriptions people are getting and the results of diagnostic tests and other investigations, which could be very valuable in when we come to taking coded data and determining how, um, what it really means, which I'll come on to. Um, and then, um, Going beyond those uh, uh, records, which identify people who've probably got a disease, um, uh, can we use other uh, health-related records? And I'm focusing on follow-up here, um, so I'm not going to go into things um, that relate more to, if you like, um, exposures um, uh, that might be re relevant to um, getting a disease, but, but about those kinds of linkages that would be relevant to trying to work out what conditions people have, disease registries, dispensing records. Um, so people might have got a prescription, but did they actually um, uh, get the drug? Um, imaging records, screening records, dental records, mainly to, to identify in more precision uh, disease outcomes. And then um, to participants themselves. So in the same way that death and cancer um, uh, and hospital data go part of the way to understanding pe people's health outcomes. Primary care goes further. Um, there are clearly a lot of conditions that are poorly diagnosed, underdiagnosed, and it may be that by engaging the participants, we can um, identify those health outcomes better than we can through the health um, system itself uh, in order to be able to, to uh, study um, particularly early onset of conditions. Um, and, and one example would be around uh, um, cognitive decline, um, psychological scores, and, and things like that. So what are the challenges? Um, well, regulation, uh, bureaucracy permissions. So despite the explicit consent from the participants, um, there is often a... Um, uh, a different, different level or different requirement um, from different controllers of data about um, uh, what kinds of consent they feel they need to give. Um, and we've seen this particularly when it's come to the, the primary care records where um, both in Scotland and Wales, uh, where we've um, tried to go on a more local basis because the numbers are, are comparatively small while we've been waiting in England for a national system uh, for which we still wait. Um, uh, we've been going through the, the general practices, and there, there has been a, a, effectively a demand for an opt-in model. So each practice feeling that it should give consent um, to allow the patient's records to be provided by UK Biobank, despite the explicit consent of the participants. Um, and the implication of that is that it, it, it is a very uh, impractical approach for a large-scale study because getting all of the general practitioners to opt in uh, 
on every occasion that data is provided um, is likely to lead to a lot of um, uh, missingness in, in terms of, of not getting that approval. So that has been quite an interesting experiment. The other challenges are more technical. Um, they're about how you get the data, uh, how you match the data to the participants, uh, various coding queries. You would have anticipated that the same organization um, that's holding data nationally in England um, would have uh, rather similar coding approaches year on year, but that isn't our experience. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, toing and froing to actually understand the data one gets, uh, the different data structures, um, of death data, cancer data, hospitalization data, and um, between those different coding systems and between the different um, constituent countries within the UK. And then an issue that, that we're uh, also struggling with is how do we present those data to the researchers? Do we give them the original codes um, with all of their um, intrinsic um, uncertainties, errors, um, or do we uh, try to get the data to a certain level um, where the quality is perhaps more assured? So in, in terms of, of progress, you know, where are we? Um, well, it's very important to bear in mind that um, in terms of our linkage, we go both back and forward in time from the original assessment visit. So these linkages are also providing us with uh, health information that... Um, goes beyond the information we were able to get from the baseline uh, questionnaire uh, of participants, um, with, of course, the obvious exception of death. Um, uh, but in terms of the, the data we've got uh, and the data that we've actually got into the system for research, there are some delays because, as I say, there are these back and forward queries to try to make sure that we've understood the data properly. Um, but the, the death data... Uh, coming from the Health and Social Care Information Centre for England and Wales and the Central Registry in Scotland, the cancer data um, from similar organisations um, are reasonably up to date in terms of the data we have uh, received. In terms of the um, hospital data, which was running very smoothly until care.data, which of course related to primary care, uh, caused it a, a fury that has resulted uh, not just for UK Biobank, but, but for many researchers across the UK, in essentially a closing down of the system um, and a requirement for all of the previously approved applications to go through another approval process um, and with, um, at least at the moment, the indication that there will be repeat uh, requ requirements for approval um, at, at differing intervals, actually, but quite frequent intervals depending on the particular project. So while that's been going on, there's essentially been a moratorium on getting the uh, hospital data for the vast majority of the um, UK Biobank participants. Uh, we anticipate that, that is, we're coming to the end of that kind of period, and we will start to be getting those data. The primary care data, as I say, we've been, um, you, despite what you hear about Wales and Scotland, my view is, just try it. Um, uh, it isn't as smooth, as easy as... You, some people say. Um, and in fact, in terms of the primary care data, this opt-in rather than opt-out approach um, has meant that despite efforts by the people who run sale, by the people who run ship, we've only so far um, got the data um, to UK Biobank for half of the participants in terms of primary care. And really, that is not a model that we could scale up to the, the vast majority of the participants in UK Biobank. What we're talking to now is um, while the Health and Social Care Information Centre and we hope the GP extraction system does get put in place, is starting to talk to the system suppliers themselves. Because, of course, you will probably be aware that there are around three suppliers that cover uh, the vast majority of the GP practices. And for any of you who have been to some of these open uh, Caldecott debates on uh, following on from, from care.data, where you hear people talking about how it's imperative that the data do not leave the general practices. It would be nice if people actually realized that they do leave the general practices and they are held by commercial organizations. I mean, the whole irony of this debate is that it's not based on knowledge. I mean, the, the GPs give their data to companies. The companies hold the data for, the, for it. The, all that Care.data was talking about was shouldn't the NHS also hold the data? 
um, but we're now talking to the system suppliers and to their GP um, uh, um, panels uh, to see if we can work uh, directly with them, since we have consent from the participants. Uh, and we found the GPs and the Royal College of General Practitioners, I should say, very supportive of this approach. What does the data you get mean, though? What do the coded data actually tell us, bearing in mind who does the coding? Um, uh, hospital data uh, is typically coded by not doctors, but by uh, clerks who are doing it largely for administrative or financial purposes. How accurate are the data? How detailed are they? How complete are they? And from the point of view of a researcher, do we need to go beyond those coded data? Uh, and I think the answer um, we have is, that, yeah, yes, we do. Um, that if we just provide the coded data to researchers, particularly when we're trying to make this resource available to the widest range of researchers, some of whom may well not be familiar with um, the problems in the data, may not be from the UK, may not understand the UK systems, that if we just give them the coded data, it's likely that um, errors will be made. So we feel that we have a responsibility to do a lot more work to turn those data into reasonably usable data. So in terms of our strategy for what we um, would call outcome adjudication, going beyond the coded data, um, the approach we've taken is that, that it matters most that if you think someone's got a disease, they've actually got the disease. So you want to avoid false positives. If you're comparing those, the, the real positives with the rest, then because any particular disease is, is relatively uncommon, um, even if you have uh, some of the controls have the disease, they will be diluted out. So the focus should be avoiding false positives, and you can tolerate um, false negatives or, or missingness. We need an approach that is geographically generalizable in terms of our adjudication for the whole of the project. With 500,000 people, with um, many of them getting you know, a range of different diseases with the numbers increasing over time, it needs to be cost effective, it needs to be scalable, but also we need to collect the information that researchers in 10 years' time will need to be able to characterize that disease. And that may be quite different than what we need now. You know, if there's a genetic test on a tumor that, that separates um, uh, different breast cancers, um, if there's imaging that uh, would be used to separate different types of stroke, um, these are things we can predict now, but we can't reliably predict what people will need. So how do we future-proof the data we collect now? And so we're taking a, strange, a staged approach, ascertaining through linkage, confirming, and then classifying. So what do I mean by that? Well, the ascertainment is what I was talking about. The death registers, the cancer re registers, the hospital episode statistics, the primary care records, and uh, particularly web-based questionnaires. Now, I, I can... My, my immediate reaction to that would be, well, there are some people we can't, e we can't email to because we don't have their email addresses. So they're not, getting, they're not being included. Um, that's true. What we're, but from the point of view of the scientific resource, um, uh, missingness is not a problem. The key thing is trying to pick up in a cost-effective and scalable way the largest number that we can of real cases. Um, so I can see there's a failure of, of inclusiveness there. But from the point of view of making the resource more valuable, uh, this still may be um, an appropriate approach. And in fact, today, we've just started sending out the first of our web-based questionnaires um, on cognitive function. So we've taken the measures that we did at baseline. and. Uh, and um, John Gallagher, who is leading the MRC um, dementia platform, has developed that into a web-based questionnaire um, with some additional uh, measures of cognitive function. And so um, the, this is a questionnaire that we hope um, can be repeated uh, every few years over time so that we can identify people who wouldn't be identified through linkage in terms of cognitive decline. Uh, and that that could produce a fantastic platform for studying uh, dementia. We want to, to then uh, roll that approach out 
uh, to other uh, kinds of conditions, as I said, um, around uh, mental illness, depression, um, uh, quality of life, joint pain, back pain, things that really wouldn't be picked up terribly well through linkage. So not necessarily inclusive, but it could be very valuable. Having identified people who we think have got a particular case, then can we then, uh, link um, other kinds of records to confirm the caseness, so improve the quality of uh, the, the definition that they've got this particular condition? So by cross-referencing to other electronic record systems. Um, and the Kaiser Permanente study, which is a study of about 200,000 people within a healthcare system uh, in Northern California, um, has found, for example, that if you compare getting, say, half a dozen psychiatrists to determine whether someone's got um, a bipolar disease and compare that with are there several uh, um, uh, records over time indicating that people have been in hospital or been cared for with bipolar, multiple records is better than a group of psychiatrists. Um, so it may well be that although the gold standards might, might be thought of as getting clinicians to do a special review, it, it, it might well be that through informatics we can actually get um, both scalable and perhaps even better assessment of disease outcomes. And of course, in the UK, we're blessed with a lot of specific disease registers that we could um, link to uh, and, and therefore use uh, to confirm caseness more reliably. And then uh, the next stage is, can we classify? Can we subdivide a case? You, a stroke is not just a stroke. You, there are strokes due to bleeding into the brain. There are strokes due to clots into the brain. Even strokes due to clots in the brain can be um, big clots, large vessel uh, clots, or they can be narrowing of small vessels and with quite different etiology. Um, so this might involve uh, working with the um, National Institute of Health Research and their networks to review the clinical records of particular uh, cases. So you can see we're scaling down from covering a half million people at the top to covering some thousands in different ways down at the bottom. Can we um, identify people who've been diagnosed with cancer, find out where the diagnosis was made, go to those hospital trusts, and get samples of their tumor and store that, or at least record where it is, so that in 10 years' time, people can go back to the tumor. And um, the way we uh, recruited in UK Biobank, as Andrew Trehone showed on his, on his uh, picture, um, was in 22 areas. About half of the participants are, are covered by 11 um, uh, tertiary referral centers in terms of cancer. And so we're doing a study in Newcastle to see whether we can um, uh, get those uh, uh, tumor specimens. Um, and similarly, with respect to can we get access uh, to imaging data uh, to allow us to get even more specific uh, outcomes. So in conclusion, how are we doing this? Well, we're trying to do it in a scalable way. We started with four expert working groups on diseases that, for which there's perhaps more experience and the, the numbers will be larger in the early phases of the study. Cardiac outcomes, uh, stroke, diabetes, and cancer. Um, in the ocular outcomes, uh, Andrew Trehan showed you the, the website for the, the eye consortium. And, and this is a fantastic example of the researchers taking UK Biobank and running with it. It's now no longer the coordinating center in Stockport. It's a research community driving the development of, of this area of work. Uh, and we're starting to see that in these other disease areas. UK Biobank is a platform for researchers to believe it is their research resource to, um, uh, to do the kinds of research that's most important for the patients um, that they, they are interested in. Um, and so uh, the final slide just shows this phased approach um, of these working groups in terms of planning, scoping, literature reviews, piloting, trying to under, uh, identify uh, what has been done around the world in terms of uh, the adjudication of health outcomes. Um, with the four areas I mentioned already uh, well underway uh, and algorithms having been developed that we're about to apply uh, in a first phase um, to the data for cardiac disease, stroke, diabetes, and cancer uh, based on the hospital data, the cancer data, the death data. As we get more data, particularly the primary care data and various enhanced 
cancer data sets and disease registers, we hope to get uh, develop even more complex algorithms with more specific diagnosis. Um, and then finally, uh, moving on to uh, this exp expert adjudication to do the subclassification. Um, so the data are, are now starting to go into the system. We hope during 2015, we'll see the first phase of adjudicated outcome data uh, that researchers can, can use. At the moment, what we're providing is the coded data with all the caveats around that. Thank you.